Thank you, uh, everyone, for coming today. And this is um, a chapter of my dissertation. Um, it's actually the kind of final chapter of the dissertation. Um, and some of the work that I did in the uh, book chapter is also reflected in this. And when offered to give a presentation, I had to think, think of a good title. And for some reason, next slide, please. Um, I had this book on my mind. <laughs> um, I've never read it as a kid, um, but I was thinking about Ikea Gibbon Nausicaa. And I was thinking about my own research and this kind of case of the Falca. And so next slide, please. Is what happens when you give a German symptom? Um, what can we find out about Germany, um, about how Germans think about nature, British or American empires um, in the decades before World War II? And so my methods are really coming from two works. The first one is uh, Steinmetz's Devil's Handwriting, which talks about this idea of pre-coloniality. So um, in Steinmetz's book, um, he focuses on German formal colonies, so on Qingdao and Kitty and Southwest Africa, and looks at how Germans had cultural preconceptions of flora, fauna, the indigenous people as well. Um, and then also the applicable the existing colonial regime. So these kind of assumptions that the Germans had before arriving in their own colonies, but also visiting others. And the other work is uh, Hoganson and Sexton's book, Crossing Empires, which came out in time. And the introduction has this new idea called inter-imperial encounters. And I found it very useful because um, Hoganson and Sexton talk about the limits of framing experiences as either like transnational or translocal, transborder and international, um, because those encompass some, but usually not all of the power dynamics and kind of experiences and the way that people think in these inter-imperial spaces. For example, you know, transnational or international assumes that people are thinking about themselves nationally, maybe not in terms of race or gender or other um, categories. And things like transborder also assume that they're thinking that there's a border left with us. And so um, Hoganson and Sexton, which is actually a book about US imperialism, um, I think their idea of inter-imperialism is very useful uh, for me and other. And so this kind of journey about the Falka for me started in November of 2018. I was at the German Foreign Office Archives, and, and there you have these kind of collections of either reports written by German diplomats or consuls in North America, um, or you also have um, German bureaucrats in Germany um, forwarding material about Canada, right? also about other parts of the world, um, but I was looking um, about Canada. And I came across this newspaper article that claims that there's German spies in Esquimalt, which is kind of a city just off a couple kilometers west of uh, Victoria in BC. And so this, um, for me, I found it very interesting because I was like, okay, great. There's like this more specific case that I can look at, um, see what kind of Germans were there, how they interacted with settlers um, in BC. And so from November, 2018, um, my next trip to Germany was in February. Next slide, please. And there at the military archives, I was able to locate um, the official reports that were sent from the captain of the Falca to the Royal Navy. And those um, are all microfilmed, so much easier to scan and take photos and, and PDFs. And so in February 2019, this was at that, the end. I'm sure, okay, great. I have these documents. I can like talk about everything that the Falca experienced on the West Coast. However, next slide, please. Um, I came back to Freiburg um, in October this same year. Because, of course, when you're doing archival work, you have to open all the different tabs and really read through the catalog rather than just use keywords. And under um, Benke, who's the captain, under his um, personal collection, there was a logbook. It was just labeled logbook, no dates, no nothing, um, which is this private diary. It, and we'll get into more of all the stuff that he talks about. So now I have two sources, right? I have the official reports, and I have the private diary. I um, kept scrolling and I found um, a really amazing source, which was a career photo album. 
And so this is kind of a scrapbook um, of his voyage um, in 1905 and 1906. And I was um, to the moon when I found this because you know all the such a rich source, and we'll kind of get into why. And so I had these three sources. Um, and in the end, they really tell three different stories. Um, I actually wrote the draft of this chapter using just this and realized that um, the story, just using the source, is completely different than when using all three together. And so I had these three sources um, to kind of recreate the voyage of the Falca on the Pacific Northwest. And so we have some uh, basic info here. So the Falca is a German cruiser. Um, you can see a photo there. Um, and it was on a global tour um, from like 1904 to 1907. And this was something that was pretty common for German naval ships um, and actually other European uh, navies was to just kind of traverse the world, stop at ports, uh, refuel, um, also write a little bit about what's going on in the city. And it was doing a tour specifically along the coast of the Americas from like St. John New Brunswick all the way down the, all the way down the East Coast and then back up the West Coast of the Americas. So this was the final leg of the tour. And it was in the Pacific Northwest from July to September of uh, The ship's captain at the time was Paul Benka. And so most of the sources that, that I look at are, are produced by the diary, the scrapbook, and also the reports. So I know roughly when it was in the Pacific Northwest, um, but I still wanted to know where, where it stopped. And again, that blog book um, that had his personal diary also had longitude and latitude, um, weather, temperature, and times, and even a physical description. So like you can see like San Francisco, Esquimalt, and Vancouver, and then all these are very specific inlets that have traveled to. Um, so we have this awesome um, source that I was able to uh, map it out. And then go to the next slide. And yes, the gift is working. Mm -hmm. So I mapped it out for each of the longitude and latitude to kind of see the voyage of the coast. Um, and this was my first kind of foray into using um, Carto, um, which is a mapping tool. Um, and in it, there was um, also um, some short falls, especially because it's about, it doesn't kind of account for time. So if it stays in one place, um, it's still one dot. But if we map it out, um, not as a GIF, next slide, please, we can kind of see that it came up from the West Coast, stopped in Esquimalt. Then along the west coast here, kind of going through the inlets, stopping in Port Sim uh, Simpson, Ketchikan, uh, Sitka, up to Skagway, then back down um, to Esquimalt, and then through Puget Sound. So we can actually get a real sense of exactly where it's going. And so with these three sources and now the route, we can actually see what um, Benka talked about and what he remembered. And I'll be focusing mostly on the photo album, just because that's the um, most visually appealing source, rather than just seeing text of German or um, German handwriting. And I'll be quickly comparing the, this you know, photo album with the other sources. So on July 15, um, Benka wrote that Victoria and Esquimalt were not very lively cities, um, that they, uh, Victoria, quote, enjoyed a similar reputation as the rest of the island, as a very boring place. Um, and his reports, official reports, said that Victoria's existence is primarily based on its virtue as being a seat of government and a naval base. So these very kind of dry descriptions of, of, of Victoria. However, in his private diary, he talks about lavish parties. Um, on July 17, him and two other officers arrived at the Lieutenant Governor's uh, residence for a formal dinner. Um, he thanked and noted the posh food. Um, but also took strides to illustrate the kind of beautiful and tasty and fully furnished house, which for him sat at a well-chosen place because it didn't overlook the one of the street. Um, and also kind of talking about all these different connections he's making, he's meeting this person, he's meeting this person, he's listing every single person he's meeting, and especially people that are um, German, he's really making strides to say what city they're from and whether there's a connection between them. And then we see here, um, you know, postcards of the government buildings of um, the Landsberg Curio Collection of Indigenous Artifacts, um, you know, the 
part Beacon Hill Park in, in Victoria, images of ships, and also a lot of business cards. And this is something that we see a lot in this um, scrapbook, are just business cards that pays for people that is now. And next slide. And so he was in Victoria from about July 15 to the, to the 19th. And then he, and, and the ship continued to Vancouver. So Vancouver at the time had about 35,000 people. Um, and since 1887, it was the Western terminus of this PRL. Uh, there, a lot like the official reports are very bland. They just say, okay, I met with the mayor of Vancouver, we had tea. There is a large port here. It's the terminus of the CPR. But then in his private diary, he talks a lot about Stanley Park, um, which was then the um, constructed park. He also talks um, a lot about the lumber industry um, and very impressed with the trees and forests. And here um, we get kind of the first um, glimpse of his film. So in Vancouver or Victoria, I can't figure out where, um, he either purchased or rented a camera. So all the ones that are these really low sepia are actually um, personal photographs of his. And thankfully, um, he's labeled them all with a legend at the back, so I can kind of confirm. Um, but we have here um, an image of the Vancouver skyline. So that's the CPR terminus building. So that's um, the main train station now, it's been rebuilt. And then this is um, Denman Island, just off of, um, off of Stanley Park, but still with the old um, old structures, right? Not this kind of um, uh, re repurposed and rebuilt place. Uh, interestingly here, there's also these two um, postcards that are not of uh, local um, indigenous children. They're from, I think, further south in the Southwest. US Southwest that are just pasted here. And this is something that comes up more and more when we keep going um, away from Vancouver, um, that he's starting to kind of mix up the chronology in these kind of spaces and putting those in between spaces between like Vancouver and Sitka into this one kind of hot line. And so on July 26, uh, the Falk had departed uh, Vancouver. Um, and it goes from next slide, please. Yeah. Almost um, mostly postcards and then a little bit mixed in Vancouver to um, personal photographs. And so heading further north, the Falco would drop anchor for a few hours, uh, usually once every day or two. Um, and so these instances offer the ship's crew moments of rest, but also chances to kind of explore the area. And at these rest stops, like on July 24, uh, the crew and the Falco uh, took a dinghy onto shore to look around. Um, the city of Alert Bay Realis, which is about 350 kilometers north of Vancouver. Uh, there, the crew was able to spend about two full days on shore. And Benko wrote um, in his diary about the impress, you know, he was impressed there about Yalis's trade schools, um, his churches of Canada and so it's kind of places of industry. Um, and then in the photos, um, we have some that are labeled of, of Alert Bay and Yalis. Um, he also talks a lot about the posts. Um, although interestingly, um, these three here are not from um, Alert Bay. They're actually from further north. So one of them, um, or two of them are from Rangro in Alaska. One is from Ketchikan. And both are about 750 to 1,000 kilometers north. But they're kind of pasted in here um, next to Alert Bay and all these kind of well-labeled images. And so we see that this is kind of breaking geography, but also the kind of sort of flattening of differences and nuances um, in order to mimic some sort of story um, for him and his scrapbook, right, for his memories. And this kind of stop in Alert Bay is completely omitted from the official report. Um, it says that it just traveled north and it's mostly focused on cities, right? So without the kind of personal diary or the photographs, um, we um, won't even, can't really tell where we stopped, right, or where the ship stopped. So on July 30th, uh, the fall could continue north. And near Bella Bella, but halfway between Vancouver's, um, Vancouver and the BC Alaskan border, uh, Benka uh, visited a town along with the German consul Lomberg, who um, he's the Lomberg is the consul from Victoria, he kind of tagged along for the whole trip. And the 
town of Bella Bella um, consisted, and I'm using his words now, of modern large wooden homes, which offered nothing interesting. Um, all um, Haltus living there um, with their European doctor um, have gone Spanish. And so Benke and Lohenberg actually crossed the strait a couple kilometers south um, to Old Bella Bella. And there Benke was satisfied with what he saw. Um, he said, and I'm quoting him again, um, there were fewer houses, what was more interesting, a cemetery with granite marble headstones and stand in front of their homes next to their tombs, right? We actually see um, some of the kind of images here with the German crew um, next to some of the places. And so Benke and his crew went into town and was surprised um, that the kind of modern cities were completely deserted. It wasn't what he was expecting. So he and the ministry tried to search elsewhere to kind of satisfy this kind of desire and these assumptions of what he wanted to encounter. And then with um, another thing here is the salmon fishing. And so again, all this is kind of void of the official reports. Um, but Ben takes a lot of time, especially in his private diary. Here, there's only really one image about um, salmon fish. Talks about the kind of limitless bounty of salmon that their crew can just go and, and fish as much as they want. They can eat as much as they want of the salmon, uh, which is um, and then photographed here, right? With this huge catch, not only at the front, but also these buckets. And this is also quite interesting because. Um, in 1888, the Indian Food and Fish Regulation in BC severely limited access to water and fish for coastal nations. And so fishing uh, salmon with nets and spears, as well as for personal and family consumption, was heavily regulated, if not banned. Um, and yet a um, German and for the fall gate was permitted, right? Kind of an example of not just privilege of uh, being not policed, um, but also leisure, right? And and how this kind of going up into this wilderness is something that these Germans can just enjoy and do more or less what they want without receiving the police. And so from Bella Bella, from Ketchikan and Alerpe and Yalis, um, the Falco arrives in Sitka. It was a, a former a Russian colony in the 18, the first half of the 19th century. Um, and is um, at that point was still, I believe, the capital of Alaska. And so here again, we see the shift from personal photographs, which I think there's just one or one or two, to purchase photographs of postcards um, of of the cityscape, a uh, one business card, um, and we also see kind of. These again, these generic images of of the Hopi woman. So not Alaska at all. Um, this is a very um, kind of common image called the Taltan Billy. It's a image that's, that was circulated in ethnographic newspapers, in travel logs, um, and typically used to kind of depict um, Pacific Northwest nations. And then the one on the top right was um, incredibly difficult to find and. Um, it's a shame that Elon Musk now owns Twitter because next slide, I was able to just ask the Alaska State Library if they know who this is. Um, and within what, three days, um, they were able to identify, know, find someone who knew who the people were in the photo and get their names as well. So it's just being in his web area. Um, but again, this is a purchase photograph, right? We'll go back to this slide. Um, mixed in with personal photographs with you know, postcards that don't really line up with the geography, but there's some sort of thematic kind of commonality. But yeah, back to postcards. And when we continue further north, um, the Falka stops at Haynes Mission and Scavenger. So these are kind of the gateways towards Alaska and the Yukon. And it was very common for um, travelers for the gold rush um, and prospectors to go by shift to Skagway and then continue north. And here we get another glimpse of the official reports of meeting um, you know, officers of the military base that they're like just describing what, what the barracks are, that they're bringing barracks, that there's this many soldiers, that, is, um, that Alaska is the stepping stone like the Philippines the north, which is quite an interesting comparison. Um, but none of the socialization, which we actually see here because um, 
with the American military officers and some of the officers on the Falco, uh, Benko was being a tourist. Um, he took the White Pass and Yukon uh, route expedition um, into the Yukon um, only for a couple hours and traveled back. But in his um, scrapbook, he has postcards from Dawson City, from Whitehorse, from places that he's, it was hundreds of kilometers away from, and yet needed to kind of paste them in, in this voyage um, up the coast of uh, Alaska. And next slide. And so now the fog is heading back south. And again, the diaries and the photographs revert to some more personal ones, not purchased or for post price. And in Juno, um, it was actually called his birthday. And in, again, not in the official report, but in the uh, diary, um, he laments that his officers forgot that it was his birthday. However, they quickly meet up on that mistake. And we actually see it in these three photos. So what do we see here in these photos? So these three personal photos, we actually see I think these two are copies as well. It's this one sideways? Yeah, that one's sideways. It's a bear. So the officers of the crew purchased two bear cubs as as mascot for the show, and this is even this um, photo is even more insane because there's two bears, there's a parrot, there's a chimpanzee there, and there's an eagle. And the eagle is also purchased um, in Alaska. Um, the other animals, I'm not too sure where. Um, but you have again this kind of you know just purchasing the wildlife for for again, for for leisure, right? The big question is what are they going to do with the bears when they're crossing the Pacific? Or when they get too big. Um, they were brought to um, down to Puget Sound because the newspapers there commented on the ships having bear mascots from Alaska. But again, it's like like with fishing, um, you know, absent from Becky's reports, um, these kind of captured animals accentuated the you know, performance of leisure nature as plaything um, in Becky's diary mostly, but also in the scrapbook. And so when the Falker returned to Victoria and Esquimalt in on the 24th of August, the personal photographs are gone, right? It's just letters, it's it's a menu to a fancy dinner, it's a programs of music for balls, it's business cards, right? And so you have this very different um, way that Bengo frames his experiences when he's in. Um, among mostly uh, middle class and white settlers in Victoria, also when he's in Sitka and Skagway, compared to when um, he's traveling further north or in between these places. And so the Falcus stayed in Esquimalt for about two weeks. There was some repairs that needed to be done. And so you get this kind of, you get even more and more of these letters. Letters and postcards. And here I find this one quite um, interesting because it's um, the uh, British Royal Engineers and also German soldiers posing together, which in nine years' time they are in each other. Um, but in, in this moment, right, being um, they're more the kind of commonality between them was not only that they're military, but they're also um, settlers and agents, right, colonial agents in BC. Um, one um, more directly involved, but the other one kind of being able to um, experience that privilege and that um, ability to just show up and right? And to kind of start wrapping things up, you know, what we see um, here in this kind of voyage, it's an example of how kind of multiple sources can encapsulate um, different stories, right? You have to bring all these different things together to get a fuller picture. But I just stuck with the with the one microfilm and just the official reports. It wouldn't really work. Um, my work is a diplomatic history, but not as a history of empire, right? And that's what I do, story of heroes. And so the Falcon's visit to the West Coast, and also this kind of socialization between the officers, um, between the white settlers, 
um, you know, brought together um, these different and middle classes of Germany, the US and Canada, right? These seemingly benign events, like exchanging business cards, attending dinner parties or capturing snapshots of pristine landscapes, um, highlight this kind of international and using Hoganson and Sexton's kind of inter-imperial behaviors of Europeans and like uh, middle-class role on the edges of empire. This case study also demonstrates how members of Germany's middle class, right? So this is, I think looking at Falk specifically, um, recorded for posterity social networks, right? With cultural elites. So the different business cards of different people, um, some, you know, the lieutenant governor, others just a real estate agent. Um, how Falk, you know, recorded for posterity these social networks um, that were across national and imperial boundaries. So members of Germany's middle class actively sought to establish these sort of relationships um, because of, right, not despite the formal context in the Pacific, right? And I think that's the quite important thing is that because they're going into Vancouver or going to Esquimalt, they're trying to establish those social networks with people that they think um, are more, more, more useful or more important um, looking forward. And so uh, reflecting on this, you know, the Falkes voyage um, up the Pacific Northwest coast has these kind of archival traces of the way that Germans practice and perform as colonial agents, but not in their own colonial empire. That's been done a lot, it's still being done, and there's really good stuff. But there really isn't that much about Germans that um, are operating in non German colonies that aren't histories of migration. So, for example, um, looking at you know, Germans in Vancouver could easily become a Canadian history of work on immigration, right? rather than a work with Germans going to Vancouver. And so really to wrap things up, you know, Benka established these social relationships with middle-class Anglo-Americans um, in several towns along the coast. He actively produced archival traces of travel to these colonial places, traces that show Germans actively building modernity across the world. Germans on the Falka were no longer merely kind of reading or hearing about these far from places, Instead, they become more active participants um, in the forming of these colonies. And so I wanted to end on this photo because it has the crew, right? I talked about Benka, right, and his sources. Um, but what about the other 130 crew members? Right? What about the Vancouver settlers, the German settlers, the British in Sitka, um, not to mention the indigenous people that you met in Yalis or Bella Bella, right? And those are things that I would like to know that those will be from a close time. 